as Trisha said, I host a podcast called Note to Self, and the idea is that we are helping people. Yeah, we have slides, because we're going to workshop some stuff. Um, so we're trying to help people cope with the accelerating world that we live in. And of course, one of the places where we live in this accelerating world is on our phones. Um, happy birthday to the iPhone. It's 10 this week, which is kind of interesting. Also, um, my son was born this month as well, so I feel like it was a very seminal moment for me a decade ago. And how much has society changed in the past 10 years because of the smartphone? Um, so I did an experiment earlier this year with, we just got the final number, 35,000 of my listeners, and we called it the privacy paradox. And we're gonna talk about that um, on this panel today, um, but I wanna just tell you about what the paradox is first. So. The paradox is that actually Americans care very, very deeply about their digital privacy. 74% say that they want to have control over their information. And yet, what happens? The Aspen Ideas Institute tells you to download its app, and you do. You don't read the terms of service. And even if you did, like, what's the point, right? Um, we are constantly opting into platforms and apps, and, and that's what it takes to be a human being in the modern world, in this economy, right? To be in touch with your friends, with your family. Um, and the question is, do we have a choice in this matter? And I would argue that at this point, no, not much of one. Um, so, <laughs> so what we tried to do with this, um, with with our project was break it down into very manageable ideas. Because the idea of digital privacy and, and how you protect your personal information is vast and touches so many different things. Um, so for one week, every day, boom. <laughs> I might have to get you to advance the slides if it's too far away. So what we did was we created a five-part plan, which was to help people take back their digital identity and their self. Um, and the plan today is to condense this five-part plan that happened over an entire week with uh, corresponding newsletters and podcasts and behavioral tweaks and changes and data management into the next 45 minutes. I think we can do it because I have these two amazing people with me here. Um, I'm so grateful because they helped me kick off the original project, which happened in January, and then agreed to come and explain some of it here today. So let me introduce Julia Angwin. She is ProPublica's award-winning investigative journalist. She's the author of Dragnet Nation, a quest for privacy, security, and freedom in a world of relentless surveillance. You, I, she had another panel this morning. She's been a very busy woman today, <laughs> which was also excellent. Um, and then Anil Dash is an entrepreneur, activist, and writer. He is one of the most prominent voices right now on the tech scene talking about how we can make technology more humane, more inclusive, and ethical. He advised the Obama White House's Office of Digital Strategy. He's now the CEO of Fog Creek Software, so actually making stuff that you might be using. Um, so as I mentioned, every day for those five days, we tackled a different topic. Uh, and we're going to let this be the guide for our, um, for our discussion right now. So if I can advance the slide. These were the five challenges that we had. And I, I want to start, Julia, what your phone knows. Day one, I think a lot of us think, well, it knows where I need to be next, right, in my calendar. It, it knows even more. Now, if you use Google Now, it knows how you should get there. It knows what the traffic is. It knows that you might want to stop by Starbucks on the way there. It's kind of uncanny how well um, our smartphones get to know us. Um, so, but I want, I want you to talk through something that you did at ProPublica, which is called the iOS locator, which I think is very, um, sure. if we can fast go forward one. Forward. Um, so basically, your phone is always communicating with the cell phone towers, because it, that's how it works. So it has to always be in touch with the world. And it also communicates with any local Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, and so essentially it's always kind of triangulating your position and keeping track of where you are. And you don't really know how often it sends that information out or whether it just keeps it in-house. And every once in a while people do an audit of a bunch of apps and they'll say, oh, this one's stealing your location data, this one isn't. And you have those menu where you can t ask if it will, you know, apps will ask for permission, but occasionally apps break out of that box. and. Um, I think Uber did that recently where they were uh, taking stuff without having asked for permission. Um, so um, 
Is there a thing that shows how to get to the iOS yeah, locator? Go so I wanted all of you just for fun times to look on your own phones. We could go forward one more, please. And it'll say, go to, these are the steps you have to take. And it actually shows you, if you haven't turned this off, which I obviously did many years ago, um, you will actually see all the places that you go and where it tracks you. It nicely lets you know, um, Apple lets you know what it is keeping about you. And, you know, to be fair to Apple, they say they don't send this back to themselves. However, uh, we have no way to verify that. No, we don't. <laughs> and I'm a trust but verify person. So, um, so anyways, um, and lots of people who you have allowed to access your location do have this information. So does anyone have uh, gotten there and seen a whole bunch of locations? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. And like, you know, to, so, oh no, Android. Uh, Android settings are different. I, I don't have time to walk through those as well. But they but this are, is, they can, you they can, can dig vary. through it as well. That's an iPhone, so you should be able to get into it as well. No, no, this, this is, is I, iPhone. iPhone. This is iPhone. But the, the interesting thing here is if you go to those, those sort of frequent locations where you end up, what, what, you're, what you're having there is not just what an app used in order to find your location, like when you used a map, you know, the Maps app and it says, I want to find your location. It's the phone knowing where you are even when you weren't in an app. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things that sort of breaks out of the model of how people think their phones work and how it tracks data about them. Right. And to be clear, I think, you know, when you want a ride and it's raining really hard and you can call, I hope, please tell me you don't still have Uber on your phone, but Lyft, <laughs> right? Um, that's a wonderful thing, right? It's like, it's literally like magic that it knows where you are. But um, we had one of our listeners tell us, you know, he found out that a flashlight app, not only was it tracking where he was all the time, but it was, uh, it had access to his microphone and his camera. I'm sorry, your flashlight app, you don't need that information. And why do they need that information? Because they can sell it, and that is part of the business model. So let's talk more about that, Anil. As a yep. technologist, can you talk about, as we call it, metadata, all the mm -hmm. different information coming in and out of your phone, what are, what's being used? So one of the things that's interesting is you, you build these systems and almost all of the creators, the, the people writing the software, creating the hardware, err on the side of getting more data. Because they're like, well, we don't know what we'll use it for, but it'll always have some purpose. Right? And, so, and, and there is a lot of reinforcement to that. Because when they do, we're going to collect all these locations, then they're like, oh, well, two versions down the road, we can add a feature where we know that that's your home because you're there all the time. And we can offer to turn on your lights because you just got home and people will feel that's a convenience. And so they always feel like, oh, this is a great reward. We're able to make a feature for people based on the fact that we're tracking this stuff. What they don't think about is, is two things. One is, the, is bad actors, right? So there's flashlight apps that are trying to steal your, your location or uh, people, you know, hack, people do try to hack phones and, and all these kinds of things. And so, um, so like known bad actors taking your data and misusing that stuff that was collected for relatively benevolent purposes, they all sort of think about, we'll worry about that down the road. And then the other part is they ascribe only positive intentions to their own organizations. Right, so Google makes you know the the operating system for your Android phones. Apple makes the one for iPhones, and they always assume that everything that their company does is going to be right. benevolent and good. And it's like they're big companies; they have thousands and thousands of employees. You can have bad actors within the company, or just miss you know misdesigned features, as we've seen recently with like Snapchat building a feature that reveals your exact address location by default whenever you, whenever you enable this new version to everybody who has access to you on Snapchat. There's a lot of people that don't want to put their you know, personal address out there in the world and might not know that they have to tweak that setting not to do that. And I would also say, like, even if you're like, well, you know, we always hear people say, like, I've got nothing to hide. If, you know, if Apple wants to know where I am all the time, go ahead and let them, right? Mm -hmm. But I think, to me, what I, what I really was trying to do with the privacy paradox is explaining, like, well, that's great for you that you don't, want, don't care if anybody's tracking you. But what if it's somebody who maybe is being targeted because of their beliefs or their origin or whatever else there is? Like, part of this dare I draw the line too quickly mm. to the Fourth Amendment, our right to mm. privacy, our mm. right to say, like, sorry, you don't get to know because I'm American and it's that simple. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely a point to that. I think th uh, the other thing I keep coming back to is even the people who say, I have nothing to hide, I don't care if Apple knows my data. Well, first of all, like you're trusting that the software is only ever going to give your data to who it says it's going to. And it's like, I write software, it's got bugs. You know, <laughs> like, it, <laughs> like you don't make systems that don't have bugs. That's, it's impossible to do, especially at the complexity of what they're doing. So even if they had every right intent, 
even if they had every policy right, which they don't, even if those terms of service didn't let them do whatever they want to with their data, which they do, you're still counting on the system working exactly the right way. And say, so all other things aside, just simple human error means that you're vulnerable, even if they didn't have you know, intentional bad designs towards your data, which some folks out there do. OK. Yes, wait. I, OK, I want to use the example of okay. your investigation. OK, let's do it. So Julia is badass and does these hardcore investigations into the tech That's companies true. that nobody <laughs> no. else is doing. Can we advance the slide? And Before we go, can yeah. I ask, is there any benefit to us of having frequent locations? If you're wondering you? where you are, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, there's not really. I don't know, unless you're confused about where you spend your own time and you would like to have it quantified for you, which some people might, for some reason, you might notice, like, look, I'm spending too much time at Whole Foods or something, I don't know. Yeah, but seriously, there, I didn't so there, I was at Whole Foods three times in one week, which was no, terrifying. Uh, the, the arguments <laughs> they would make, um, and you can judge for yourself how valid they are, one is they are building a lot of home automation tools, and I think in the future, being able to know where your work is, where your home is, they'll be able to do the right thing. They have things like reminders you can set to locations. So it's like whenever I get to home, or whenever I get near the grocery store, remind me to buy some eggs on the way home. Um, and it'll sort of pick that up based on having those locations. So they're starting to build features that are smarter around those things, but there's nothing where it's really required that much. And if, the, if you don't know what it would use it for, then you're probably not using those features. Right, so it's probably better to turn it off, and then if something comes along where it's like, this is needed and you mm -hmm. really want that service, then turn it back on, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, the defaults are all set to totally permissive, the way the companies have them. Yep. And then what I do is flip everything to default off and then turn on by, you know, I'm actually one of those crazy people who turns on location only when I'm using Maps. I like go in and change the setting, which is no way to live and I don't recommend it. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying like that's where I, my defaults are set extremely low. Yeah. But it, it'll ask you too. If there's something that you're doing that you use an app that needs that, it'll just say, can you please turn this on and you do it. Before we go forward, I would just say that that question, like what benefit is it to me? is exactly what we wanted mm -hmm. to get people asking. It's a very simple question. Where am I personally drawing the line between convenience and between not feeling okay about who has access to my personal information and data? And right now, the way that these um, platforms are built is they don't really want you to ask that question. Download, download, do use it, use it. But that is like, I think the keys mm -hmm. that we all have to say, you know, and my line may be different than yours. A 18 year old is gonna be different than my 73 year old mother. I totally get that. But I think it's a very personal choice and that we all need to be cognizant of it. So yeah. it, it's a broader And it's, thing. it's directly analogous to the real world. If you go to the store and you buy a pair of socks and they're like, can we have your phone number? And you're like, why do you need it? Yeah, why do you and, need and, and you have to have that same attitude towards you know the tech companies. Oh, this was a, a sharing of somebody's sentiment regarding the frequent locations tracking <laughs> in iPhone. Just thought I'd share with um, with that. So <laughs> let's advance one more. Okay, Julia, tell us about your Facebook investigation. Um, yeah, so we wanted to know what Facebook knows about you. So it's not. Um, easy to know actually you go on to Facebook and if you go deep into a whole bunch of settings which change all the time you can eventually find a thing where they say here's the things that we've determined about you from the way you use Facebook and um, they list all sorts of things but I could only see sort of what they knew about me which is nothing because obviously I um, have defaulted <laughs> off. So I'm on Facebook, but I have no friends and no activity, which is like <laughs> kind of ridiculous. Um, so <laughs> I know. Julia is delightful. Like if you yeah. want to be her friend, you should come up to her I afterwards. I am friendly. <laughs> I'm just not friendly on Facebook. Um, and um, so people in my office would look at it. And so we were like, we should build a tool so that we could see what are all the categories that they're placing people in. So we built this extension, which you can go download now from our website. Um, and it just shows you what Facebook knows about you. So when you log in, it's a little piece of software. You click install onto your um, computer. And by the way, it doesn't collect any data at all. <laughs> it has like a little privacy policy. We know nothing about you. And, um, and then it shows you all the things that um, Facebook says it knows about you. And we were shocked by how much they were collecting. Because you know, it's like you could imagine that they know the things you list. First of all, you write down, I'm. I live in the city and they know about your friends, but there were all sorts of categories mm. that were completely wackadoodle. And I think, do you have two of them up there? Um, My favorite category was breastfeeding in public. Yeah, no, <laughs> but there was an even better one called texting awkwardly oh, yes. in public places. 
So that's a category of person. There are people yeah. who text They've, awkwardly in public places, and how does that get used? I don't understand exactly how it gets used. For ad targeting. I mean, for ad, I don't, well, I guess what, they sell this kind of to advertisers. <laughs> Do advertisers want to buy ads towards people who are awkwardly texting? I guess. Uh, well, this is that <laughs> thing, again, where we're getting that sort of latent intent where they're like, well, maybe someday somebody someday. will. So like anything we can deduce about you or think that we can. Uh, it got my race wrong, for example, but whatever. Um, they, they think they've sort of deduced these things about you, and they're saying, well, if this is something that somebody wants to buy an ad and target a person with these traits, we're going to let them do it. And even if nobody ever buys an ad for people who text awkwardly or people who breastfeed in public, it doesn't hurt them to, from their standpoint yep. to capture this data and assign it to you. Now, that's assuming, again, that no other bad actors have that data describing you. And I guarantee you some of those descriptors about you are inaccurate. There's no way they're all accurate. So let's go to the next slide for that point of it, right? So you also, in addition to asking people to download the extension to see what Facebook knows about you, you ask them to sort of rate how they felt, whether they were like, yay, it knows that I have kids, so I'm going to get great ads about camp, or bad, like it thinks that I have three kids, and so whatever. There could be lots of reasons, or just plain old creepy, which yeah. is... So people rated it, and you can see there that, you know, um, that people were really mad about things being wrong, right? Because it was like everyone was assigned to be a Farmville fan, like everybody, and it was just really so weird, weird, right? And it, like um, everybody was like, I'm not a Farmville fan, I hate Farmville, right? And so, <laughs> and it's sort of weird how sometimes I feel like I'm more mad when things are wrong than when they're right, but I should be actually more mad when they're right because that's the yeah. like creepy thing. So it's funny how your reaction varies. And then people found the most creepy stuff was about how they had deduced that you were living away from your family, you were in a long distance relationship, all these kinds of things that feel personal that you might not ever explicitly ex ex disclose, right? But they had sort of deduced from your behavior. And so everyone gave us those ratings and contributed all their categories to us, but we didn't collect any information about who they were. We just know all the categories. And we got 54,000 different categories, which is a huge number. Well, and it's also the number, the, one of the stunning things to me is how many data points they have about an individual person. Yeah. So there can be hundreds. I think in my case, there was 2,400 descriptors of me. You had 2,400? You're <laughs> active on Facebook. I spent a lot of time on that. Wow. Uh, well, I also like, one of the, uh, my, this is not what I'm advocating, but one of my things I like to do for fun to make my profiles less useful to them is make them a little more random and have a lot more sort of garbage data in it. Obfuscation. Can we talk about that, yeah, please? Yeah, we can. Because, like, I wanted to, that was one thing I was going to ask my listeners to do. I was going to, like, we're going to have obfuscation day where you just put in <laughs> random stuff that makes no sense. Yeah. And then I had people come back to me and be like, yeah, no. It's not pleasant. It's, but also, it doesn't really work. No, a friend of mine made a uh, browser extension that would click like on every like button on anything you ever saw. <laughs> Uh, I on like the internet, everything. Exactly, and it was and it was interesting <laughs> because you know he said it just destroyed Facebook for him. Like he couldn't use it because it was just like incoherent <laughs> and it didn't know what to show. And like you get all this stuff from things you don't care about. Um, and I was sort of like I, I found that interesting. I liked the, that, that idea, and I was playing with ideas of like um, clicking to that point, like things that are directly you know opposite, like it can be politically or culturally or whatever, and whether it does stuff with it. And and what I found is I think Facebook's system is getting smarter. Yes. Where they're sort of like, we know we have garbage data on everybody, and so we're just going to throw away the outliers, and, and we'll still list it, but we're not going to use it for showing it content is, to you. I mean, this is one of the problems, like, so in general, in the world of surveillance, um, you know, there's like, people get burner phones, for instance, as a classic example of trying to obs ob obscure your identity, because your identity is tied to your phone number, so if you get a diff different phone number, um, Maybe they don't know. So I did this when I was writing my book, Dragnet Nation. I got a separate phone. I used cash. I had a fake name, like the whole thing. And, you know, but it was the dumbest thing in the world because I went to all the same places, right? Mm -hmm. And my patterns mm -hmm. are exactly the same. And you're the calling same. the same people. I'm calling the same people. And so even though I didn't have that frequent locations map, I know that the, this is how they build those profiles. And so I realized I was fooling nobody. And certainly, I'm sure you may have read, but there's a million stories here and there on um, you know, the CIA caught these people because it was like the one burner phone that was mm -hmm. making the right pattern. Mm -hmm. So, you know, although burners are portrayed in the media sometimes as this great uh, anti-surveillance technique, in fact, you know, they're pretty, not easily, but with some effort, and it's getting easier by the day with better computation, uh, they can figure out. Because your behavior is the tell, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's our behavior that has never been able to be tracked so effectively. No one has ever been able to track humans this effectively before, and it turns out our behavior is very consistent, 
despite yeah. our dreams of being unique mm -hmm. and um, very revealing. I want to make this real life now okay. because we're not all as crazy and intense as Julia about <laughs> privacy. Mm. And so, but that this is where I feel like let's draw the line to other things. So okay. I heard these crazy stories from my listeners, like one guy who said, um, well, a woman who had been, because they're all interconnected, Google and Facebook and all these things. She was concerned that she might have a drinking problem. And so she went on Google, like, ha, like and, you know, asked one of those questions. How do you know if you have a, like, drinking problem? Then two hours later, she goes on Facebook and she gets an ad for her local liquor store. And she left me a voicemail crying because she was like, you know, it'd be one thing if it was even sending me like clinics, maybe where I could get help. But the fact that that's how it was targeting me, she felt so betrayed mm -hmm. by Facebook, this company with whom she had a very intimate relationship. And, um, and so, like, to me, I, I was thinking, like, I don't want to be tracked because I believe in privacy. But then you hear these little betrayals of privacy that right. actually are extremely powerful on a very, on, on a daily basis. Yes. I mean, the thing that's heartbreaking is my daughter's a middle school teenage girl. And unfortunately, I wish this wasn't true, but she and all her friends who are incredibly gorgeous obsess about how they're too fat and ugly. Oh, I know gosh. it's heartbreaking. And then online, all they get is ads for how to lose weight. And it's oh. like it preys on their fears. It's just awful right and that is i don't know that it's necessarily targeted advertising because actually the entire internet has one big weight loss ad as far as i can tell <laughs> but they feel like it is because there's also a perception that it's a targeted ad right mm -hmm. and so it because just, some of the other ads at least certainly yeah, are targeted. certainly are right when they look at uh it's you know so some shoes those shoes are going to follow you around so it's just like a really it's unfortunate because it really preys on your, your fears and that is really heartbreaking but and there's also how they capture the data right so there are apps that ask permission to use your microphone because you're like oh i want to use this to chat and then they will keep the microphone on. And you know, this is increasingly becoming the case where people are seeing ads that they're like, well, how did it know that I wanted to yes. buy that product? And it's because the microphone was on and they're able to do voice recognition and they're able to do targeting. And um, there's no, nothing that precludes them, according to their terms of service, from actually just monitoring your calls. Right? So if you FaceTime with somebody or you do a Facebook Messenger call with somebody and you talk about, you know, boy, I'm thinking about buying a new car and an ad shows up, it's not you being paranoid. Like these, this is the str a straight line extrapolation of what they said they want to do. I want to just say, just so you know what the craziest people have done, and I'm not doing it, but a lot of my <laughs> friends actually remove the microphones mm -hmm. from their phones. Really? Yeah, they cut yeah. the wires. They cut it. Really? And then they use only a headset to connect when they want to talk. And like I have literally considered doing this, but I just know that I'll destroy my phone somehow when trying to cut oh, the microphone. Let's do a <laughs> pop up in Brooklyn it's where you kind can of bring hard. your you phone have to and solder we'll things it. and stuff. Oh yes, <laughs> let's do it. All right, let's go to the next slide be though, before we phones. decide <laughs> our next project. So we've been talking about the personal element to it, but actually on a larger societal level, you also discovered something else from so your research. So we thought this app, you know, this whole like learn what Facebook likes about you was a fun experiment. We did not expect to stumble on something kind of um, disturbing, which was really that they were assigning ethnic affinity to people. Now, what did they assign you? Um, African American. Oh, cool. I was also African American, actually. So congratulations. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, I. Uh, so uh, actually, a lot of people in my office who are not African American were, and that's how we noticed it. We were all like, "Why are we all African American?" Well, and they use affinity, so it's this ambiguous yes. thing. Yes. And, it's like, and so I, they I, have sure this I have an affinity. Crazy sure. thing called affinity, which is mm. <laughs> this is how they define it: people who like people of that ethnicity. So. It is really <laughs> weird that you would try to categorize people way, way, with, about whether they like people of an ethnic affinity, because that in itself is insane. It's also worth noting they have no ethnic affinity choice for Caucasian, right? It's only uh, Asian American, African American. Maybe that's what the data reflects. But there's also, know. but there's Jewish American. Jewish yeah, American, yeah. Hispanic. And um, so when we noticed this, that they were collecting it, and then we were like, well, what are they doing with it? And I think, I don't know if this is You also went slide. to a civil rights lawyer who was like, uh, excuse me, not well, legal, right? Well, no, you can collect it, but mm -hmm. so is this the Can we go to the next slide? Is the next one? Oh, sorry, go Oops. back. I okay, that, have skipped the that's other okay. one. Sorry. So what happened was we were like, what do you do with it? So we went to the ad buying menu where you could buy ads and there's a little drop down, like do I want to buy for these, um, you know, you could choose. I want to target my ad to this ethnic affinity. Well, what we noticed was there was also a drop down menu called, I want to block my ads from ever being seen by these ethnic affinities. And so we were like, wait a minute, you can just say, I don't want any black people to see my ads. 
And so then... And their defense was, no, we just don't want you to have to be seen by people who like black people. <laughs> right. But hold on, right. we didn't finish it. So basically, we were like, wait a minute, there are laws in this country. For instance, you cannot market housing. We have the fair housing law and in a way that is discriminatory. So we're like, oh my gosh, is this happening? Are people buying housing ads and saying, don't show it to people? So we were like, how can we test this proposition? Well, unfortunately, we can't test it except by buying an ad. So we bought an ad <laughs> for housing. And we were like, block it from African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, like all brown people. And it went through, boom, sailed through, purchased in two seconds. And uh, <laughs> we called Facebook, we were like, how does this not violate the fair housing laws? And, you know, they were like, well, it's not really people's ethnicity. It's just that they like people's yeah. ethnicity. It's like some of my best friends are. Is that yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, and so then, so they, at first they defended it. Then the Congressional Black Caucus uh, wrote a letter. The, you know, HUD started investigating. Hmm. And they reconsidered. And so they, um, they built a new system that, a classic Facebook. They were like, well, we built an algorithm to scan for discriminatory ads. And I was like, why don't you just get rid of the drop down menu for <laughs> excluding <blocking> ethnicities? <laughs> like, and they're like, no, no, no. We have to build like a giant supercomputer algorithm thing that scans every ad, looks to see if it's discriminatory. And I was like, well, I hope that works out. But at <laughs> least they have tried to address this. But it was a really shocking discovery mm. from what seemed like a kind of a fun experiment. Which is why you should give money to ProPublica, because they're doing amazing oh, things like you. this that are actually changing <laughs> how technology is being built. Seriously. I, th I think it's a really good example, too, of um, the tech industry's tendency to see, you know, every problem is a problem that should be solved with software. Mm. And if there's a problem in the software, the answer is more software. <laughs> yes. You know, and it's sort of like, did you put enough on it? Like, just keep hitting it. And, and, yeah. and, and I think there's a really, this tendency to say, that, to think that they can solve every problem this way. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's the impulse we also have to push back on as, as users, consumers, and citizens is that it's not always going to be a technological solution. Sometimes the answer is just take that menu away. So let's look, let's think about it. Could there be a more ethical way to collect this data and still deliver the product that people want? Like, let's say I'm like, what's the problem here? I really love hip hop music and I'm getting, you know, I now know that I could get these tickets. And mm. so they think I'm African American or actually I am African American. What's the issue? I think, you know, people aren't averse to filling out surveys or giving information where they know there's an exchange. I think that the problem here is consent and understanding, right? Is I don't know when I'm giving them data, and I don't know what they're going to do with it when I do. And that means there's always going to be an imbalance. So the, the, the core tension is not, are they going to gather data? I mean, lots of, lots of companies gather data on me. People used to do that in the days of paper mailed catalogs. Like, that all exists. The question is about... Um, do I have a mutual relationship with them, or is it all sort of happening behind my back without my knowledge? I mean, I would say it's like kind of like we've given them a blank check, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's not like, um, usually you engage in a transaction and like you're getting something for it and that's that, but this is like a perennial forever transaction and they have rights over everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just, um, we don't have this kind of economic transaction. So there's no way, I always talk about how the data market is so confusing because everybody's like, well, I don't know, why should I be scared? I don't know how my data is going to come back to yeah. hurt me. And the thing is, it's not predictable, right? It's like yes. you don't know the truth. You can't price your data correctly because you can't predict that in 20 years somehow this little random piece of information from Facebook will be added to some employer who will decide not to hire you because of it. And so we can't do long-term pricing of our data because we don't know the true risk. We haven't quantified them yet. Yeah. I and love, can I just do an anecdote? A listener of mine um, comes from an extremely religious family um, and he ha was sort of exploring that maybe this wasn't the right path for him and he had joined a couple private Facebook groups about um, agnosticism and atheism and, um, and it revealed that information to his wife who promptly divorced him. Um, and so that to me is a very, like, un that, that is a violation of someone's privacy. And as we do things more than just buying concert tickets, but really explore ideas and our concept of our identity, and, and we don't necessarily have the lines dividing <laughs> between what is private and what isn't, it, it worries me that people can't do the, the sort of deep work that they need to do to figure out who they are. Yeah. Well, to that idea about writing a blank check for them to them about what they can do with your data, if you were to write a blank check about your pri most private information to someone, it wouldn't be to an industry where um, most of the people who come up with a computer science degree have not learned about a lot of civics issues, have not learned about a lot of issues of social justice and social equity, are not versed in a lot of sort of basic 
you know, things that we think of as infrastructure of society. Um, and certainly, you know, most computer science programs don't include an ethics curriculum at all. So if they haven't gone through all of that kind of training, that's not the first person you'd be like, sure, you can see all my data right. and decide what to do with it. <laughs> right. Can we go forward one more slide? Okay, so um, we're going to talk for five more minutes and then let's take questions and open it up and talk about this. So get your questions ready. Um, I, we didn't get into a lot of this before, but I am fascinated um, in talking about the ways that we might not know that we are being identified. So there's been a lot of discussion about um, Cambridge Analytica, which is a data mining company that um, allegedly can use Facebook ads to uh, know voters in ways that they don't even know themselves and then influence them with emotion. So it's a kind of digital ad marketing called psychometrics. Um, it, there's a debate going on right now whether or not the Brexit campaign used it, whether or not the Trump campaign used it. Uh, the company sort of implied that they did. We did an episode on it where actually we learned that they did not use it. But regardless, psychometrics is the future of all of this. Can you explain more, Julia? Yeah, so psychometrics is this idea that basically, in addition to following your behavior, they can make some inferences about what kind of person you are. Are you, you know those tests you used to take like Myers-Briggs, like I'm INTJ, intro introvert, well I'm not introvert, I'm extrovert, whatever, you know, all those those things. Um, INFJ. So, <laughs> I, yeah, so well, um, I remember when I worked my summers at Hewlett Packard, actually you had to take that and then they categorize you into your job based on like how you did on it, which I, even then was creepy. But now the idea that you could do it remotely and you don't opt into this quiz, it's just actually like assigned to you and that that there's a whole field of obviously about psycho of persuasion, the field of how to persuade people, that it is different people are persuadable by different types of things. And if you can categorize them by how they are easily to be persuaded, you can target those ads to them. And one thing that is really scary and unknown, and the reason Cambridge Analytica I think sort of prompted so much outrage is that we have never had a, an election like one we had just now where we couldn't see the ads. So if I was targeted with an ad from one of the pre presidential campaigns or a local campaign, only I saw it, right? Facebook knows all the ads, but otherwise, like even the opposition campaign doesn't really see it unless they've managed to get themselves into the targeting group. And so we have this black box where we really don't know what happened, like which is why everybody is sort of debating, like did Facebook, did it have something to do with the election? We don't know. Facebook and says everything's cool, it's, don't worry, nothing to see here, but we don't know. And Can I give an example? Yeah. So for example, like let's say there was an issue about um, immigration. It might be like, oh, well, Julia's um, on the neurotic side, and so let's show her an ad that ha instills fear in her yeah. so that she votes for this topic. Whereas Anil is very patriotic, so let's use an ad about immigration with a flag so that it brings out his need to protect nation. Um, that finely tuning the ads, which is, you know, that's what d advertising has always been, right? To yeah. make people feel emotional. Yeah, but being able to do that at scale, right, where it's that tailored for everybody is new and also, um, you know, it's interesting in, in, in the academic world, in the research world, when you experiment on people, especially on something having to do with their emotions, you would have an independent review board approve whether you can do those kinds of tests and experiments on people because there are impacts. There are impacts to showing people who are vulnerable and nervous things that stress them out. It has a real effect on their lives. And interestingly, Facebook itself has had its own researchers do uh, experiments about like whether they show happy or sad news on your timeline and then measure the response from people without having an independent review board approve that test. So they've experimented on the emotions of their users before and a lot of what you know we're hearing in these advertising platforms is the way they're, they're headed is that the advertisers will be given the ability to experiment on the emotions of people. And that is something that... Um, there was a leaked report from this Australian ad agency that back to your middle, middle school aged girls, um, that you could know when a middle school aged girl was at a point of feeling insecure, and so this was the perfect point to target her with weight loss tea advertisements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which just... And that's already mother, happened. <laughs> like that's not, kills me. Yeah, that's not science fiction. It's like the, the, if you are wondering, are there advertisers trying to manipulate your children's feelings, the answer is yes, right? And they're trying to exploit that for money. And the question is how many and how much is the platform enabling that? 
So a couple of things I want to mention about this. One is when I was writing my book, I tried to go, I went to, two, I identified 200 different data brokers who had information on me and I requested my information from all of them, mm. including some psychometrics um, companies. Mm. And none of the psychometrics people gave me the information that they had because um, something you all should know is we're the only Western nation without a baseline privacy law requiring commercial data brokers to give us access to information about ourselves. So Europe has this, Canada has this. Um, basically in those countries, they can go to a data broker and say, give me the information. What psychometric category am I in? They can dispute it, they can correct it, and sometimes they have deletion rights. So that is something that we don't have. Um, the Obama administration have proposed it several times, but you know, um, the big tech companies are also the engine of our economy and have a lot of influence in Washington. Yeah. So this well, and is one of the staunchest objectors when the Obama administration proposed it was Facebook and Peter Thiel's on the board and also a, you know, a key advisor on tech policy for Trump. So that's not going to change. It's not, it's not likely to pass, but I would just like you to know the political landscape, which is that there, you know, we should have access to at least the way, the very least the way that we're categorized. Yeah, by yeah the groups, description right? of myself. I should know what you know about right. me. And secondarily, like it is sort of shocking that you can't, these ads aren't, like I can go to any TV station in New Hampshire and say, show me all the campaign ads that were bought. And they have to say how much they were bought for, how much they paid, and they have to have a tape of it. And so we know how election advertising plays out in the old media Television, world. Television, newspaper, right? Yeah, all of that is auditable. And we can't audit it on Facebook. So that is something that is also worth thinking about, that we have already set that as a standard. Maybe it should be expanded to the digital world that we should be able to audit, at the very least, political advertising, if not totally, um, you know, predatory advertising yeah. towards people's vulnerabilities. I want to go to the next slide, um, if I may. So I want to go to a little bit more solution-minded because I think I definitely hit yeah, the dystopia sorry, we scared right you there. All. So <laughs> this is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Um, I, I did a selfie with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. That's what a nerd I am. But I went to visit him, and he is sort of looking very big picture at what do we do to flip the model here so that we become owners of our personal information again. Would there ever be a time where um, Facebook would have to say to you, uh, we would like to request your personal information, and you could say, you can have this, but you can't have that, and you can have this, and you can't have that. Now, it seems a lot of people, a lot of technologists in particular, are like, ha ha, that's never going to happen. But I feel like the man invented the World Wide Web. Maybe he could also maybe fix it. So just want to let you know on a very high level at MIT and um, Oxford Institute, there's a lot of uh, research going into that. And can we just do the next one as well? Um, and, and what we've then, on the last day of our Privacy Paradox project, um, which you can still do, by the way, we asked people to do something very simple, which was with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, which was write your own terms of service, which is to really think, you know, where do you want, so it, privacy is blank to me. And you might say, privacy is squishy, you know? Or privacy is really important. Before I click post or send, I will think about what Julia said about ethnic affinity. <laughs> and whatever, it could be anything. So if we could just do the next slide as well. So we had lots of people fill it in and sort of decide that they were going to print it out and put it next to their computer so that any time something did pop up and ask for access to per personal information, or maybe didn't ask, um, that there was a, a, a reminder. Because I think it's so easy to just walk out of here and be like, OK, where do I have to go next? Oh, da, 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 da. It's how we live. So this constant, let, let's not lose sight of something that is invisible, essentially, all around us. Um, let's go to questions, shall we? Um, wait for the mic. Yeah, the mic's going to come around, I think. Yeah, right in the back here. Oh, sorry, wherever it is. Yeah, go for it. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Um, so I was freaked out about two months ago because I learned about this website called FamilyTreeNow.com. And it was essentially, um, so this is a little bit outside of the social media realm, but a website that had my name, my address, every address I'd lived in in the last 15 years, wow. my family's names, my birth date. Um, for anybody who wanted to see it. So it wasn't even just Facebook or advertisers, it was the, the general public. And I discovered there are a few websites like this that scrape information. Um, 250. Yeah. So yeah, my question <laughs> is, <a> few. <laughs> hey, wh where, do they, where do they get this information? How is it, how is it publicly available? Um, and I obviously unsubscribed, you know, brought my, um, took my, requested my information be taken down from that site and one other that I found. But if there are 200, sort of, yep. how do we keep up, keep up with that? Um, so first of all, we should have this baseline privacy law, but secondarily, um, I did go and put, um, they, they all collect it from public records, so essentially, 
they go to the driver's license bureau, and then they go to motor registration, property records, and compile it all together and build these dossiers, and they're just hundreds of them. Um, what I did is I tried to opt out of all of them. Um, I was successful at getting out of about 92 out of 215. How much um, time did that take you, Julia? Uh, one full month of my life. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't recommend it. Um, but I will say this, that uh, there are some key brokers that sell to all the other brokers, the back ends. Axiom, Experian, um, the credit agencies, the big credit bureaus are really the f the feeders of all those. And once I got out of those, I noticed that when the new ones popped up, my data wasn't in there. And so there are a couple. Um, unfortunately, there are people who try to do this for you, who who um, who will say, "I'll opt you out of the big ones, and you pay me like twenty dollars." But the problem is that those um, they take your twenty dollars and they send the request, but the data brokers don't honor it from a third party, so you really have to do it yourself. It's a completely unfair marketplace, and I wish it wasn't that way, but that's just yeah, the facts on the ground. It could be regulated <laughs> to be different, but the uh, So the main ones I would do are Exper Axiom, Experian, TransUnion, and um, there's another E. So anybody who's monitoring uh, your credit um, yeah. score? Equifax. Equifax, Equifax thank, thank you. Nice. <laughs> yes. yeah. Those four are the big ones. Well, and they make a ton of money selling your data. I mean, that's the other thing, too. Yep. It's like they're not making money just keeping your credit score and having somebody check no, it no. once a year when you apply for a credit yep. card. Like, this is part of their business model. Okay, there's another one in the back over here. I'm the moderator this time. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally <laughs> taking over leadership Julia, skills. I know leadership skills. <laughs> Julia was the moderator on the panel this morning that I saw, and she was like master moderator. I was like, oh crap, I'm gonna be out of a job. And my panelist called me bossy. Her panelist called her bossy, <laughs> which was kind of crazy. It was a woman too. Yes, please. <laughs> sorry. Yes. So, oh, I had a couple of uh, questions, points. One is, don't you feel a bit like you're fighting a lost cause? Uh, yeah. And um, it's kind of, it's kind of bit. It feels a bit like uh, coming to a, not even a gunfight, more like an F twenty two fight with knives. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the other thing that I w that I would ask is, you know, when you look at this um, into the future, right now you focus most of your discussion on data that I uh, actively contribute, whether knowingly or unknowingly by my actions. But if you look into the future, you know, with I autonomous vehicles and, you know, and cameras all over the place, really, uh, it doesn't matter anymore if those guys cut the, the microphone uh, cords or not. You have today tens of thousands of cameras kind of tracking people's activity uh, in different spaces, and it's all kind of, you know, used for various uh, use cases. So that's another point on the lost cause kind of thing. And then the other thing that I would ask is, you know, I'm sure that all of you are, you know, strong believers in democracy and kind of in the, in the, um, in the, our, our collective wisdom, uh, whatever it is in this country this year, I don't know. But, the <laughs> but in general, we kind of believe in democracy. But in the point of, you know, deciding on giving away our data, <laughs> Okay, uh, where billions of people have decided to do that, and actually, whenever they they download an app, it asks them, "Do you want?" Apple asks them, "Do you want to give location data?" Even for that flashlight, like millions of people uh, clicked yes. Are they are there not now? Are we kind of looking down on them, saying they're just stupid and they don't know what they're doing in that? particular part of their life while in other things in the you know when they need to decide on the president then then we kind of count this on their best question ever I think each of us are going to have different very different answers so yeah. let Neil start uh, it's a couple parts um, it is not futile to uh, question these decisions and to push back on the choices these companies make um, well it's a trivial example but I think it's telling uh, about a year and a half ago, um, Instagram said they were going to change their terms of service. And the way people interpreted the change was that it would allow them to put ads onto your photos. Uh, they quibble with whether that's true or not, but certainly they wanted to imp increase advertising on the platform. And because people felt like their you know, ad the photos of their friends and their families were going to be annotated with ads, they really pushed back. And in fact, you know, lots of major accounts, a lot of followers sort of protested or deleted their accounts. And the company backed down. And that's, you know, Instagram's owned by Facebook, right? So you have the 
biggest social platform in the world saying on the basis of users objecting to their terms of service change that they were not going to make that change. Um, it is possible for users to organize and to push back against the policies of these companies. It happens all the time uh, if we're coherent at telling those stories and we have ways to tell them. One of the burdens on uh, those of us who are in the tech world and build technology and are trying to articulate you know, that we should be making better choices is how to give ordinary consumers enough information to be able to object and to raise an objection and to organize. And this speaks to the point about the, do we trust people? Are we being condescending to them if we say they don't know that you're sharing your location when you say okay to sharing your location? Um, there's a couple of things that are interesting there. I think one of the parts is that many of these choices happen before we know the implications of them. Right? So you can say, well, yeah, I don't mind right now it knowing where I am. And also, we say, I want to share my location. That's a different thing than you can create a database of all the places I frequently go. Right? Those are different choices. They never say a prompt of, can we create a database of all the places you frequently go? Right. And so we have this thing where this one behavior implies another. And the nature of data is the more you combine it, the more you learn about a person um, or think you learned about a person. That's something where um, it actually is not possible to consent to all the future things that a company might think to do with my data. And so even if we have complete trust in consumers being able to make educated, informed decisions, even though these companies deliberately obscure and obfuscate a lot of their policies, <laughs> let's pretend they didn't. Even if I have a perfectly good decision-making process, that doesn't mean they're going to keep making good decisions in the future that I trust having based on giving them permission in the past. Um, in terms of hope and hopelessness, uh, obviously I'm accused of this all the time, so <laughs> it's fine. I'm used to it. But I would say this. I, the thing that gives me hope is if you think about um, the Industrial Revolution, you know, it was amazing. We learned to build factories. We, we really changed our economy. And, um, you know, for 50 years it was considered, like, totally fine that, like, you just had to scrape the soot off your windowsill every day. It was cool. Like, everything was black. People died of black lung disease in the mines. And, like, that was just part of life, right? And you would have been hopeless to say, we're going to clean this up. But we did. We cleaned up the environment. We did. We, we decided we were going to do it as a nation collectively. We passed the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, and we all started recycling and picking up our dog poop, and we started caring. And I think this is a similar issue. We, we have to all start caring, and we can fix it. We're really good at solutions in this country when we put our mind to it. That is so true. Can we go to the next slide? And I just want to give my own answer. We had 30,000 people sign up and share with us how they feel that they changed after they did this very simple five-day boot camp. Um, and 80% now know how to get more privacy in their life, not for nothing. And also 70% said that they were ready to do something about it. So for me, it's about saying that this is the next chapter in digital literacy, that this is what we need to be teaching our kids. In addition to learning how to code and learning how to make these things, we need to learn how to think about them as well. And um, I mean, that's kind of like turning into my life's mission. And I think for me, it's also about kids understanding that you don't have to share everything. There is a place to be alone, solitude, boredom. Um, I wrote a book about it. It's coming out in the fall, and I'm on a panel with Sherry Turkle on Thursday where we're talking about exactly that. So to me, it's this interdisciplinary approach to looking at technology. When We won't be calling it technology in the future. It'll just be life, like you said. Like, It'll be in everything. So we got to start like codifying it right now. Like I remember as a kid, you would never open someone's real mailbox, right? It was like a cultural norm that you don't touch people's mail. How do we start to have other cultural norms where we respect each other's um, right to privacy online in addition to offline? I get very excited about this. Okay, and we have another question. Yeah, two, two disparate questions. One, does it make any difference, and my technical term may be wrong, of who hosts your email account. Does AOL sell things? Uh, does Google sell everything once you're on Gmail? Second question is, what are the most unknown vulnerabilities uh, from a financial point of view? Mm. In other words, if you resist uh, opening a charge account at a department store, if you don't want online banking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, other than had hiding cash under your bed and doing everything in cash, what don't we know? Um, take this one? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to start with banking and then work backwards. So on banking, um, uh, the most important thing you can do is uh, make sure that your uh, bank account has two things. One, a long password. 
Okay, every one of you does not have a long enough password. I know it just by looking at you. Um, and it, uh, so for, if you do an online banking, I actually think it is uh, secure and a good way to do it, but you need to have a 30 character password. Yeah, I know. She's Calm hardcore. Down. She's hardcore. But here's how you're going to do it. You're going to open up the dictionary, you're going to close your eyes, you're going to point to a word. Then you're going to turn the page, point to a word. Put five words together, you'll remember them. It's called Diceware. There's a method online if you want to read about it. It's mathematically proven, blah, blah. My daughter runs a business actually making these passwords. You can buy it from her. Um, but <laughs> basically, uh, get yourself a really long password. And then the second thing is, most important, even more than the password, is two-factor. So. Uh, Two-factor authentication in, in the banking context is every bank has an option, which they hide somewhere, which says, even though I got in through my password, do not transfer money unless I enter this PIN or I mm -hmm. enter a second thing, right? So I left Citibank because it didn't have that back five, ten years ago. Now they have it. But I was like, no, I won't do banking, online banking. If you don't have, I have to have two steps because even if they break that first one, there has to be another step like the PIN before transferring money. So that's my rule on banking. And I've forgotten the first question because I don't even know. Oh, email. Email. Oh, email. I have so much to say about email. email. Well, <laughs> you know, I would have railed against Gmail up until last week, but they just said they're going to stop reading everyone's email. By the well. end of this year. I know, whatever, by fingers crossed. <laughs> by the end of this year. Okay, my point is if they do that, they would be a great provider because mm -hmm. they actually are a great provider. But yeah. I have been unwilling to use, I have it actually just for my mom email. So all play date arrangements. You don't are, have any friends there either. Uh, I have no friends <laughs> anywhere, obviously. <laughs> you have us. <laughs> but, um, but so, but Gmail is a really. Stable platform, right? Because you also don't want hackers to get in, right? And they're good at defending against hackers. Yahoo and AOL are terrible at defending against hackers. So it depends on what your threat model is. Yeah. But they're and they're not reading it. But unfortunately, everyone else can. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Gmail's reading it, but no one else can read it. It's like, who do you want to read it? So of course, I right. have this thing called RiseUp.net, which is a bunch of activists who got together to build their own platform. I'm here to provide you guys amusement, guys. Okay, so you have to join it. You have to sign their mission statement to be against. Um, Capitalist oppression, <laughs> gender oppression. Oh, there's another one though. You could do Proton Mail. So our 10 year old got his first email account, and I was like, it is my duty as a parent to set him off on a private path. This is the rest of his life. I screwed up and signed up with Yahoo. I am so in the hole with Yahoo. I'm doing an entire episode about trying to escape from Yahoo. It's really, really hard, especially now they've been sold to Verizon. In any case, though, my 10 year old has an encrypted Swiss email account. And I am telling every parent, like, we want all our kids to be on Proton Mail because maybe we can start, at least start them off yeah. on the right foot. And, and to the broader point about does it matter which host you provide, which service provider you provide, it absolutely does. And you can't be expected to read all the terms of service. But there are people starting to write the reviews. I, I think about uh, Rebecca McKinnon's project, right, where she's re reviewing things on freedom of speech and, and sort of um, uh, uh, some of the more important social issues as a way to evaluate these services. There are people doing that around privacy. There are people doing that around um, uh, what the policies are of the companies that you're supporting by using these services. And so there are ways to be an informed consumer. They're still a little rough around the edges. It's not like you know the 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 blue book where you're going to go buy a car and it's got the everything broken down. The but consumer the reports is trying to build. They're that, getting right? there. So yeah. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're trying yeah. to build like a privacy That's ranking. Cool. So eventually there will be. Exactly. It's just it's it's on the cusp where enough people realize this is there where there will be the consumer reports review and just go and see this is the one that's best for me and and the key is to be able to. Think about yourself as an educated consumer and citizen when you're making choices about technology, the same as you would about knowing, you know, where that apple was sourced from that you buy from the grocery store. Okay, we have time, I think, for maybe one more, maybe two. So the, the last two questions kind of anticipated this, and I wanted to come back to the title of the session, which was the paradox, because mm -hmm. there's been a lot of emphasis on the negatives and not as much on the positives. Um, and, and so two things that were coming up was one, the, the law and the futility, and the other was the technology. And the law and the futility seems to me to be, in one sense, hopeless if you talk entirely about the United States. The, the internet and the digital world just crosses borders. And your analogy about the Industrial uh, Revolution is perfect, uh, which was, you know, the dirt and smut that we're cleaning up in the United States is now being spewed out by countries that are 50 years behind us in their development. And, and so you can't fix it by changing laws in our country. So, so the, the concept of a law has to be something which addresses something at the feeding end, not at the 
what can you do with the information? And if you want it to cross borders where laws may not be as good, and in Russia it's unlikely in the foreseeable future we're going to have laws that will protect our privacy. So it seems to me that that gets to the technology thing. So Bitcoin and, and <coughs> encrypted email and so on have come up with algorithms that require that both the sender and the receiver participate. And so it seems to me that the law that we're looking for, and I don't know if this has been thought of or, or tried or if mm. there's a, you can comment on this, the law that we're looking for is a law that says before you can collect any information, you have to use one of these, you know, kind of dual technologies so that the person who is, whose information it is can opt in or opt out by giving their password, not their password the to around. some, some yeah. subset like a Bitcoin transition. Uh, rather than a law that says the company may not share it. And so the law should be, it seems to me... Flipping the model. Telling, telling, telling the company you can't put something out on, on, you know, in an app that doesn't allow the person to opt in or out with a technological mean, not a legal mean. A so lot of people have tried this. They uh -huh. call it personal data lockers, and yeah. the idea is you lock up your data and you release it uh, little valves, you know, when <laughs> under certain terms. The problem is data is, have, is easily replicable. So you can never capture all of it because it's just replicated. Like your behavior is being tracked not just by your phone, but by something here and some other camera there. And, and so capturing it all is almost impossible. So you can never really get a full monopoly on your data. And therefore, it's hard to make it valuable through this valve system. People have thought about it. There's like World Economic Forum panels and discussions for years. Well, and this is part of what Tim Berners-Lee is working on, it, why we say it's probably not going to work. It might work, but it I might. just haven't seen it. It's, so my point is people have died on this hill. They keep dying on this hill. I hope it works out. I'm just saying I've seen a lot of, you know, not it, successful. It also efforts. requires <laughs> the big tech companies to be respectful of your wishes with your data and not a one of them. Facebook is under 20 years supervision from the FTC about violating privacy. So right. is Google. So and is so Google. is Apple. And so, uh, yeah, right. So, so like, <laughs> which, who are you going to go to that hasn't already broken the law on privacy policies around you? And that's what the what law being really weak. I want to end this on a positive note. <laughs> I will say that I went to visit Senator Wyden on Capitol Hill, and he has really turned himself into the spokesperson for our digital rights and mm -hmm. privacy. So the conversation is starting on Capitol Hill. Um, also, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case about um, our cell phones and right to privacy with that. Um, I think we're just at the very beginning of yeah. having this conversation. The law is finally starting to realize that they have to be involved in some way. Um, and so I also think it's up to all of us to do our part. This mm -hmm. is the only way we can do it. Tell your family, ask your babysitter not to post pictures of your kids and tag them on Facebook. Mm -hmm. All sorts of little, little things, they do add up. As we saw with Julia, she changed the way Facebook collected data. That is not to be sneezed at. And so I hope, really hope, you feel a little bit empowered as you leave here and at least a little more educated because that's what ideas are all about. They start as ideas and then they become revolution. <laughs> <All right. laughs>